I've entitled this morning's message, Dry Formalism, and hopefully you'll understand why the title in just a little bit. But what you see up there on the screen behind the words is a fig tree, and my family loves figs. Uh, We have been blessed here in Oregon because we've always loved figs, but never in our lives have we been overwhelmed with so many figs. We have uh, Carol Hansen, one of our members here, has a couple of fig trees in her backyard, and she has just showered us with these gifts, and others of you have as well. And um, we love all fruit. We love mangoes. We love papayas. We love bananas, especially from Brazil. Um, If you haven't tried a banana in Brazil or some tropical country, you haven't really eaten a banana yet. But figs are an amazing fruit. It's a delicious fruit. And uh, we have abundance of them here in Oregon. Figs will grow in most places in the United States. But fig trees grow best in places where winter temperatures do not drop below 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So places like Florida, California, Oregon, where it doesn't get so cold, They're easier to grow um, in milder climates. They're a low-maintenance plant in milder climates. They don't require so much special care. So we actually planted a couple of fig trees in our backyard. We don't have a whole lot of sunshine. We don't have a lot of space. But to my surprise, they are doing really well. No figs yet. This is not mine. This is not in my backyard. So ours is just looking very pretty with lots of leaves, but no figs yet. Um, In places like Oregon and California, figs are one of the easiest fruits to grow. So that's the advantage of figs. They are low maintenance, easy to grow, don't require so much attention. Um, Spanish explorers introduced figs into the United States in the state of Florida back in the 16th century before it was the United States of America. And priests at Mission San Diego planted figs in California in the year 1769. So that's how they were introduced on the West Coast in the middle of the 18th century. And uh, this is how the dark purple figs became known as Mission. And California produces 98% of the figs in the United States. So here are the Mission figs. Fig trees, interestingly, unlike many other trees, have no blossoms on their branches. The blossom is inside the fruit. Many tiny flowers produce crunchy little edible seeds that give figs their unique texture. Figs are like little packages that contain the tree's flowers inside of them. Uh, We've been studying figs at our house recently, and that's why we have some of this information to share with you. Um, Figs are so unique in that the flowers being inside, they require a unique pollinator. Now, when Abigail found this out, she actually cried. She was not happy. Figs are pollinated by fig wasps. She thought she was going to have to stop eating figs because those tiny bugs sometimes die inside each fleshly pod. And some people actually believe that figs are not vegan because with many varieties, there is a high chance that fruit contains a wasp in it. Actually, the little buds eat the wasp, and the wasp disintegrates. Um, And that's not the case for all figs, but many figs. um, You may be eating a wasp somehow, indirectly. There's a big debate, if you Google it, are figs vegan? Some people do not believe they're vegan. Uh, We're actually not vegan. We're plant-based. So we eat figs, and we don't care whether they're vegan or not. But yes, it's a very unique fruit. And so why are we talking about figs? Well, I'll get to that in just a moment. Just a few more interesting facts. Figs or fig trees can live for hundreds of years, but on average, 30 to 50 years. Sturdy, sturdy trees. Matter of fact, I think it was Carrie that was telling me, you were trying to get rid of one of your fig trees, right? And it just keeps growing. It just won't go away. They are resilient. 
um, whether they're giving fruit or not, they are resilient. The oldest recorded fig tree, according to the Guinness Book of World Records Encyclopedia, was over 3,000 years old. The one you see here on the screen is about 200 years old. Uh, there are over 750 varieties of figs around the world. So we just have the tip of the iceberg here in the United States. And they're good for you. Eating one half cup of figs has as much calcium as drinking one half cup of milk. Ounce for ounce, figs have more fiber than prunes and more potassium than bananas. Most modern Israeli gardens contain a trained fig tree. Looked after, it can grow to 30 feet tall. So the fig is actually native to the Middle East. It's the first fruit mentioned in the Bible. Some even believe it might have been one of the fruit that Eve and Adam ate that was forbidden, but that's debatable. Obviously, that's not what we're going to get into, but it's mentioned there in Genesis chapter 3. The fig leaves, at least, are mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. The land of Palestine was described in the Bible as a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8. The fig is first mentioned in Genesis 3, 7 when Adam and Eve pulled off the leaves in order to make a semblance of a covering. The fig tree is used to indicate the prosperity of the Jewish nation. When you read about the fig tree producing an abundance of figs, it's a symbol of the people of Israel prospering. But there are many passages in the Old Testament referring to God's judgment on his people, on his nation, the nation of Israel, where the falling or destruction of figs is used to indicate the Lord's judgment. So with that in mind, I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. So why are we talking about figs this morning? This is not a health lecture, and it's not a history lesson. Matthew chapter 21, like I said, the fig tree and the fig is actually an important uh, symbol in the Bible, and it's mentioned throughout Old and New Testament. And there's one particular story here in Matthew chapter 21 that is especially intriguing because, you know, Jesus was a healer, and he was a giver of life. Throughout his ministry, he spoke love, and he spoke life, and he healed the leper, and he raised the dead, and he gave sight to the blind. But on one particular occasion, and we believe this was actually an acted parable, Jesus, rather than give life, he takes away life. He curses, and of all things, he curses a fig tree. One day, after Jesus had driven out the money changers in the temple in Jerusalem, and this was the week of his crucifixion. And we all know that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, um, but throughout that week, he was staying in a little town just up the mountain outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. And in between the city of Bethany and the city of Jerusalem, there was a little town called Bethphage. You read about it in Matthew 21, verse 1. Bethphage, if you read it there, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus was walking through this little place called Bethphage. Does anyone know what that word means in Greek? It means house of figs. There were many fig trees on the road, on the way from Bethany to Jerusalem. And on one particular occasion, we read about it here in verse 18, shortly after, a day after the driving out of the money changers in the temple, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, it says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, Jesus was hungry, it says. And in Matthew chapter 21, verse 19, the Bible says that Jesus saw a fig tree by the wayside. 
he went to it, and he found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the last part of verse 19 says, The fig tree withered at once. What an unusual story in the life of Jesus. Jesus curses a fig tree. A fig tree that from a distance was beautiful, full of leaves, promising to give lots of good figs that season. Jesus comes up to it and he curses it and immediately it withers and dies and no fruit ever grew on it again. Well, that is interesting. Let's unpack what is happening here. Now, this has to have been an acted parable. Jesus taught through parables, and he taught many spiritual lessons about the kingdom of God and about Israel's relationship to God through parables. So, um, again, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's going there every day. This is the week of his crucifixion, and there's this road just as you leave Jerusalem, and I guess, there we go. You see, this is the temple in Jerusalem, and as you exit the city through this road, this is the road that leads to Jericho. It goes up the Mount Olives, and before you get to Jericho, there's a little town real close to Jerusalem called Bethany. This is where Lazarus and his sisters Martha and Mary lived. This is where Jesus raised Lazarus. And this was one of the places that Jesus stayed. This was like friends of Jesus that he stayed with. So if you read Matthew's account, Mark's account, throughout that week that Jesus came in triumphantly on a, on a donkey into Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple, well, he's going to Jerusalem every day. He's having conflicts and confrontations with the religious leaders in Jerusalem, which culminated in his crucifixion, and he would go and stay in Bethany. And so he was going back and forth, and on one particular day as he's going back and forth, he spots at Bethphage, house of figs, this fig tree full of leaves, and he curses the fig tree. So this is so you can get a little uh, acquainted and familiarized with the geography Jerusalem is northeast of Bethany. You climb the mountains to Bethany, and then you go back down to Jericho. This is a road that Jesus was well familiar with. As a matter of fact, he told the story about the Good Samaritan, a person who was going from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. And so um, on the eastern side of Mount, the Mount Olives, fig trees can be seen in leaf, at the end of March, beginning of April. And this was around the time that this event took place, that Jesus curses the fig tree. It was the week of Passover. So it would have been late March, early April. Climate is not that different than in Oregon. So really it wasn't the time of year that this fig tree would have been producing figs. And when you read Mark's account, Mark actually states that. This is not the season of figs, at least not yet. The figs usually start producing in late May, early June um, in this part of the world. So fig trees can be seen in leaf at the end of March, beginning of April, but this particular fig tree is actually full of leaves. So it is giving the promise of ripe figs already. From a distance, it has the appearance of a tree that is already producing ripe figs. The baby fruit buds normally would be seen in February before the leaves appear. The normal winter figs ripen in May and June, and the summer figs in late August and September. Fig trees must have grown well in Bethphage, which means the house of figs, and this particular tree seems to have been uh, growing and uh, showing the promise of early figs because it's full of leaves earlier than normally it would have had uh, full of leaves. So this particular fig tree stood out as having an unusually full coverage of leaves for Passover season. 
which would have encouraged the hope of early fruit, and that's the best explanation we can come up with as to why this would have been a disappointment for Jesus, but why he uses this symbol of disappointment in the fig tree not having figs yet. What lesson is Jesus teaching? Well, um, remember, the day before, Jesus was in the temple, and he drives out the money changers, and he's basically uh, denouncing the nation of Israel of not having fulfilled God's purpose for it to bless the nations. God had said to Abraham that through you and your descendants, the nations will be blessed. In many ways, that fruitless fig tree is like the fruitless temple, which was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, according to Isaiah. A place where people, not just the Jewish people, but all people would learn about God and his character. But rather than be a blessing to the world, they were misrepresenting the character of God. Discourse after discourse, Jesus alludes to the fact that Israel is not fulfilling God's purpose for it. And so the fig tree becomes a fitting representation of the nation of Israel. It had all the right forms. It had the right temple. It worshipped the right God. From a distance, it gave promise of good fruit. But as you get close, what you see is a fruitless tree. And so Jesus is likening the fruitless fig tree to the fruitless temple. Oh, yes, it was beautiful. And the ceremonies that were being uh, practiced in the temple were the right ceremonies, and they were actually worshiping on the right day, and they were observing the right festivals. And they were even returning the right amount, 10%. But Jesus looks at all of that, and he says, that is nothing more than a tree full of leaves. And I believe that fig trees are beautiful trees, but I did not plant two fig trees in my backyard for ornamental reasons. I could have chosen more beautiful trees for that. I planted two fig trees in my backyard because I want to eat figs, because my kids eat more figs than Carol and some of the other church members are able to provide for our household. And so we want figs. Guess what's going to happen if after three or four years, these fig trees are not producing figs? It's coming down. We had an apple tree in our backyard that is a nice tree, but it was taking up a lot of space, and we don't have a lot of space in our backyard. No apples. Guess what happened to that apple tree? It's gone. Well, the fig tree is beautiful, but not that beautiful. If it's not producing figs, it has to be cut. Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, about a fig tree that was not producing figs. This was a spoken parable. And the owner of the land says, we have to cut it down. But then a mediator steps in, the one that takes care of the land on behalf of the owner, and he says, wait, sir, let's give it another three years. You can look this up in Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Let's give it three more years, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on it. I'm going to put fertilizer, and I'm going to dig around it, and we're going to make sure it has every advantage possible in order to produce ripe figs. And then the owner of the land says, okay, if after three years it produces figs, it stays. But if it doesn't produce figs, it gets cut down and thrown to the fire. And that is another parable where Jesus is illustrating that God's plan for the nation of Israel was that it produce fruit. Fruit is God's goal, and this is a parable symbolizing that. Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he's saying the same thing in different words. He speaks about followers of Jesus 
who will have in the last days a form of godliness, but denying its power. What does it mean to have a form of godliness? Well, if we go back to Jesus' analogy, it's like having a fig tree with lots of leaves, but it's missing the most essential thing. What's the most essential thing that we want from the fig tree? Is it the leaves or is it the figs? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Speaking about the Holy Spirit. So they have a form of religion. They have leaves on the tree, but there are no figs. So what does that look like in real life? It looks like this, and that's what we're doing today. See, today we are all participating in the form of religion. Going to church is one of many, many ways that we partake of the form. We call it formalism. And by the way, Not a bad thing, not at all. Jesus never condemned the fig tree because it had leaves. He condemned the fig tree because it lacked figs. When we talk about the form of religion, when we talk about the form of godliness, we're not saying that this is a bad thing. As a matter of fact, the form supports us, or at least it should support us, in helping produce the fruit, the form of godliness. Going to church, participating in religious services, standing up or kneeling down for prayer, bowing your head, these are forms. These are, in many ways, outward acts of respect and worship. When we sit down and we pray for our meal, that is a form and not wrong. We encourage it. We believe we should. But you know, sometimes in my home, our prayers for the meal sound like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for the food. Amen. And when we do that enough times, it becomes something you just do without thinking about it. And what you're doing is not wrong because the words that are coming out of your mouth are the right words. But sometimes you can say the right words, you can even sing the right words, your lips are moving, the right sounds are coming out, but the question is, where is your heart? Jesus, putting it another way, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, quoting Isaiah, says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what does that mean? It means that we are participating in the right form. Maybe we're going to church on the right day. Maybe we're returning the right percentage. When we open our lips and we speak, the right words are coming out of our mouth. Happy Sabbath. Or when we sing, we're singing songs that are theologically accurate about the character of God. And this this is all very good, but Jesus says... You can honor God with your lips, but your heart can be far from him. So at our house, we're trying to encourage something different when we pray for our meals. Don't say, dear Jesus, thank you for the food, amen. Thank him for something else other than the food. Before you pray, actually think about what you're going to say. Because if not, it just becomes a dry, rote, mechanical participation, it becomes formal. And formality is not a bad thing, but formality can sometimes become destitute of the real heart experience that God intended. That's what Jesus meant when he cursed the fig tree. The leaves are good, but if it has no figs, if it has no fruit, then it is not fulfilling its purpose. If you actually go throughout the book of Matthew or throughout the Gospels, you're going to find that fruit is often used as an analogy, a symbol for something. John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 verse 8, when he preached, he said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce figs, not just leaves. 
You see, it wasn't enough just to be baptized or to you know, go into the waters. Going into the waters is form. Nothing wrong with it. It's symbolic, and it's a powerful symbolism of dying to an old life and being raised to new life. But the act in and of itself is a form. It's like leaves on a tree. But the fruit, that's what God is after. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. You see that Jesus uses this analogy throughout his teachings. John the Baptist also used it. It's found throughout the Old Testament. Fruit is what God is looking for. And Matthew, I mean, uh, Paul in Galatians really unpacks it nicely when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the evidence in a person's life that the Spirit is actually leading. The Spirit is actually guiding them. Your fruits will reveal who you belong to. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Well, let's just talk about a couple of words that we use a lot often, and I think we need to understand it. Um, religious and spiritual. You know, sometimes we hear people say, so-and-so is a religious person or so-and-so is a spiritual person. I would like to propose to you that there is a difference between being religious and being spiritual. And I want to refer you back to the analogy of the fig tree. Being religious is like having leaves. And again, Jesus and the apostles and the prophets are not being negative about the form or being religious. Being religious or having religious disciplines in your life, such as waking up early to pray and to read the Bible. Other religious disciplines is going to church one out of seven days a week on the seventh day Sabbath or returning a faithful tithe. That's being religious. Now, these two, though they are different, sometimes are overlapping. For example, you may return tithe to God because you are so moved in your heart by his love and his generosity towards you, and you recognize that the health you have and the job you have comes from him, and you gladly in a form of worship return tithe and in that case being religious and being spiritual would be one and the same thing in that particular case but being religious is not necessarily being spiritual as we mentioned earlier as jesus said a person can honor god with their lips in other words they're saying the right things they're praying at the right time they're going to church on the right day, they're singing the right song, but the heart can be far from him. Well, that would be like being religious but not spiritual. Being spiritual is very simple. Paul explains it well in Galatians chapter 5. When you are led by the Spirit, you are walking in the Spirit. You're saying no to the flesh. Somebody insults you or somebody... Uh, says something that is offensive to you and you're tempted to respond in the flesh you're tempted to be angry retaliate you are tempted to be offensive that's the flesh paul says when you walk in the spirit there is peace love joy long suffering patience so you're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. The interesting thing about it is you can walk in the flesh and still be religious, meaning you can walk into church on the right day, you can carry the right book, you can sing the right songs, and yet you can hate somebody in your heart. It happens all the time. I've seen it, and sometimes I've partaken in it. 
where I've been in the flesh. I hate somebody. I can't forgive that person. I'm offended, and I want to offend back, but I'm saying the right words. I'm singing the right words. I'm praying the right words. So you can be religious and walk in the flesh. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is describing a religious person who walks in the flesh. As a matter of fact, Paul was a religious person who walked in the flesh. Do you remember his story before his conversion? What was Paul doing before his conversion? Was he religious or was he an atheist? Was he a monotheist or a polytheist? Was he worshiping one god or many gods? Was Paul going to church on the right day? And yet, what was he doing? He was hating people because they differed from him. He was persecuting Jesus' followers. Was Paul a religious person? Was Paul a spiritual person? Well, according to his own words, he wasn't. He was walking in the flesh because he hated other people. He was hurting other people. And according to Paul in Galatians chapter 5, you're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. And if you're walking in the spirit, this is the fruit that's going to be seen in your life. Love, long-suffering, peace, joy, long-suffering, self-control. That's walking in the spirit. When you're walking in the flesh, it's fornication, it's hatred, it's jealousy, it's resentment, it's hatred. The list is long. You can read about it in Galatians chapter 5. Patience, the fruit of the spirit. It's tricky because um, before I had kids, I considered myself a patient person. And after I had kids... I started realizing that I am not as patient as I thought I was. Now, outbursts of anger, that's one thing that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5, under works of the flesh. And then patience he lists as one of the fruit of the Spirit. And the interesting thing is, I did not have outbursts of anger for a good 10 years. You know, I was, I was angry as a teenager, which is typical. And then I gave my life to Jesus, and, you know, I went to, I went to college, and I, I just never had outbursts of anger, I'm telling you. I was known by my friends as a very calm and patient person. And then I had kids. And all of a sudden, outbursts of anger. And every time it happens, I realize, Lord, this is the flesh. I'm walking in the flesh. This is hypocrisy. How can I preach and say the right things and I'm, I'm, I'm yelling at my kids? Yes, I yell at my kids. I'm trying not to anymore, but uh, let me tell you, yelling at your kids um, is an outburst. It's, it's not self-control. Now, there is a time to be hard on your kids, and I believe you can be tough on your kids and be spiritual, but there are certain types of ways we respond to our kids that are just fleshly even if we are doing it with good reason or good motivation. So Paul lists it in Galatians chapter 5, and it's hard to read Galatians 5 because a lot of times you read it and you say, Lord, I'm in the flesh. I'm not walking in the Spirit. But I go to church on Sabbath, so it gets confusing. So I'm trying to help you understand that there's a difference between being religious and spiritual. You can be religious and you can lose your temper with people okay but you can't be spiritual and lose your temper okay you can be religious and you can gossip okay but you can't be spiritual and gossip those two are mutually exclusive you understand what i'm saying and so um as i had kids and realized hey i have a problem the Spirit needs to address this. You surrender. You don't allow your religious life to serve as a cloak for your problems. And this is a temptation for religious people. And all of us here are religious people. We want to use religion as a cloak for our defects of character. God is calling us to character development. Character development happens through the Spirit. Okay? It's walking in the Spirit. 
as the Spirit brings conviction to your heart that you're not supposed to speak evil of your fellow church member or your family member. You're not supposed to lose control as you're disciplining people or kids or whoever in your life. You're not supposed to treat people with disrespect. That's the spirit. Don't allow religion to cover that in a garb that is self-deceptive. This is what happened to the children of Israel. You know, in several statements in the Old Testament given through the prophets, God basically says, I'm done with your worship. I'm done with your feasts. I'm done with your holy days. I'm done with your Sabbaths. In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with ten thousands of rivers of oil. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Folks, these are the figs right here. Burnt offerings, refraining from work on the Sabbath, returning tithe, those are the leaves. All fine and good. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, he describes what leaves look like. But in verse 8, he says, He has told you, O man, what is good. In Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 23, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Well, who asked for them? God was the one that told them to keep these feasts and to come together in these solemn assemblies and to keep the Sabbath. So why is he saying that he hates the very things he asked for? He says, take away from me the noise of your songs. Why? Because they didn't have the figs. He goes on to explain in verse 23, justice, treating people with love and kindness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected, you have neglected the more weighty, the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Do you see the figs in this passage? Do you see the leaves in this passage? Now, if you keep reading, Jesus is not saying that the leaves are bad. He says, these you should have done and not leave the others undone. But you see here that Jesus considers some things more important than others. Matters that are more important, justice, mercy, and faith. As a matter of fact, on one occasion, Jesus was asked, well, what is the most important commandment in the law? Or what does it mean to keep the most important commandment in the law? And Jesus, rather than get into a theological debate, he tells a story. And in this story, he's going to contrast a religious person who's walking in the flesh with a spiritual person who may not even know all the right forms of the right religion. Jesus tells about a man who was beaten and stripped of his things and left to die on the road to Jericho. And then a Levite comes along and a priest and they don't stop. Now those were religious people. They were going to the right meetings, probably on the right day to worship the right God in the right way. But when they saw a man who was left dead, and this was a fellow Israelite, they just kept walking probably for fear of touching a potentially dead person and then being unclean and not being able to go and participate in the ritual, in the religious festivities, the religious ceremonies that they were on their way to partake in. But then comes a Samaritan. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 40. Beautiful little story that Jesus tells to further illustrate this idea of having fruit, not just leaves. 
the Samaritan, with moved with compassion, uses his time, his resources, and he helps a fellow human, saving his life, treating him with love and self-sacrifice. And uh, friends, I want to suggest to you that these are the figs. This is the fruit. This is what matters at the end of the day. It's not the form. The forms are given in order to support the growth of the fruit. We believe that we come to church, not because coming to church is fruit, but it's supposed to facilitate our bearing of fruit. I need to repeat that one. You come to church not because it is fruit, but because it supports you, or it should, in bearing fruit. There are people that don't go to church that are bearing fruit. Like the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't go to church. Because if we're doing it right, this is a place that will support people in their journey to bear fruit. But I hate to admit it, but sometimes we attend church and we are fruitless. And we're not even concerned about it because we've confused going to church with the fruit itself. And sometimes we even have the mentality, if I could just get my kids to walk into the facilities of the church, they're safe. Your kids coming to church is not fruit. But hopefully the church will be a place where your kids will be supported on their journey of bearing fruit. That's what Adventurers is, right, Eric? It's, it's an opportunity to help kids on their journey and you've done a really good job of pointing that out to the parents well done everything about church is about supporting everyone in the journey but going to church even on the right day is not fruit don't ever confuse those two I want to have fruit how about you I want to have the fruit of the spirit that phrase says it all. Folks, it's not us that produce it. You can't work hard at producing fruit. You have to submit to the Spirit. Amen? Let's stand together and let's ask God's Spirit to produce that fruit in our lives. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we've been reminded today that you love us and want to produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. And that you have given us tools, you've given us resources like church, like the Bible, like prayer and fellowship with our fellow believers. These are all resources that you've given us to help us as living trees to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. We want to be more patient. We want to be more loving. We want to be more kind. We want to be more um, joyful. And we want to be like Jesus. So help us, Lord, to be bearers of your image as we continue on our journey. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.